Uh, this is Ed, and I'm in San Diego. I know you can't tell, but this is the logo and Blue Ocean. And with us in New York today is James Moss, Curzon Central. Welcome, James. Hi, Ed. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, great. Uh, I thank you for putting up your new logo. This is one of the first times the world will see this. I think it's really simple, very attractive and tells the story. James Moss, you've recently rebranded, as we're seeing, and bringing together uh, the tech and the uh, bespoke services for high net worth individuals and others. Tell yeah, us more. exactly. Thanks. Yeah, exactly that. Um, so Curzon um, has always been doing real estate and has always been doing relocation. And uh, during COVID, we moved much more to a tech platform on the relocation side, which so the, the two have always been reasonably separate. Um, and we used a different vehicle for that. We used uh, a, a company called um, Absolute Relo, uh, which really was, was doing quite well, getting a good head of steam. But it was all based on more of a technology page you go type of model. The tech was uh, was absolutely fantastic. The app is great, for example. But what we were finding is, is that post-COVID, as the world is now, what, three or four years on from COVID now, um, there's been much more of a convergence uh, of different sectors sort of all coming together. So um, you have your private client real estate side, which for us includes people like international students and and business people, partners of law firms, you know, all that sort of stuff, sort of high end relocation stuff, more private client stuff, if you like. Um, uh, when these people often buy properties as well as rent. So it's, it's an interesting mix. Um, and then we have the sort of traditional or well, traditional and non-traditional corporate relo relocation side. The corporate is more traditional where companies want to move executives and employees and talent around. Um, and they, it's interesting how it's devolved into a combination now of uh, what I call traditional services, destination services, which is much more hand-holding type of thing. Um, it's what companies often are used to, uh, particularly for more senior people. Um, and also a desire and a need for much more cost-effective um, and tech-friendly, uh, sort of more mobile, shorter projects sometimes, uh, moves or relocations, as we as, as they call it in the industry here, um, and that is where our app technology and Absolute's former technology was was really really good, which is now Curse and Relo. And what we've now done is that we combine the two together because there's such a convergence. So from the point of view of clients and users and our own team, everyone now works as Curse. Um, and it's just much, much easier to deal with. The other thing is, is that we find, we've often found this in, in our business, is that when we're working uh, with uh, private clients or conversely with senior relocation clients, they often turn around to us and say, hey, could you help us buy something or rent something or do something other than you're just doing at the moment? Uh, to which the answer is yes. So um, I'll give you a, a good example. We, we acted um, a while ago for one of the, the big four uh, management tax consultancy firms. And we moved a couple of their partners around. And one of their partners turned around afterwards and said, hey, I actually need to buy a house as well. You know, I've moved from here to there. I've settled down. We rented a place. But we actually don't want to buy a house. And it was actually quite, quite a big house. Um, and as, as one would sort of expect in a rather lovely area. And we were able to do that, that for him and his family. And we subsequently bought two other investment properties for him, which we ended up managing and helping him steer and so on. Um, so that's just one example of where the, the, the two cross. Um, so yeah, it's a great combination. Curzon, uh, Curzon Central is our main brand. Uh, the uh, the Relo side, the tech Relo side is is Curzon Relo. That is the name of the app in the app stores, uh, where you can go to uh, you know the Apple Store, the Google Play Store, and find it there. So yeah, all all together now. Wow, that's quite a story. Congratulations. I, I'm just, 
Ah, hallo. Was, <lacht> Gesundheit. <lacht> wow, I'm human. Thing. <lacht> <laughs> that's like a thing. I think that's the first time in four years I've sneezed on the air. <laughs> but I've sneezed in the air, but not on the air. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, back to business right. here. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, New York conference that's being hosted by uh, the U.S. headquarters of HSBC, the London Hong Kong Bank, Global Trade Bank, First time in New York, and that's coming up on 12-12, and you're going to be a speaker and featured go-to person about the the business scene and about this innovation that you're talking about right now. And I thank you for uh, enabling uh, that. Well, great. I think it's going to be a fantastic conference. Uh, thoroughly looking forward to it, Ed. Um, you always get uh, great participants and panels and very engaging uh, yeah, so I wouldn't miss it for the world. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to be there. <laughs> Thank you. So our opening keynoter, uh, after uh, Doug uh, Gallardo and me do our intros and take the mic around the room and introduce people in the audience, uh, is going to be a PhD uh, organizational development uh, industrial psychology guy who's working with a company called Radical. His name is Ken Oler. And he's going to be talking about uh, the impact of the uh, recent U.S. elections on business strategy and how uh, the surprise of the win and the scope and dimension of it, um, meaning the demographic uh, support that uh, President Trump has, has wound up getting, uh is is first of all fascinating but second of all it's got people on edge uh across the board all kinds of people not just uh, one group so he's going to be talking about the business impact what's going on in companies and how companies have to communicate with the team and of course customers primarily the internal team and making sure everybody is uh is cool and and can focus on business and that's what he's going to be talking about the techniques he's also going to do something with their own technology a short uh lesson about how one's individual skills and specific interests uh, can uh, merge together and he's going to do a lot better explanation than me but it's all about who are the people in the company on the team and how do you get them to communicate better, clearer, faster, and more comfortably? It's by sharing ideas, of course, and by knowing something about the people and where specific interests lie. I, I, uh, that, I think it'll be, I think it'll be fascinating actually. Yeah. And, uh, so thank you very much. Yeah. Now there've been some interesting changes uh in america with the 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 election and the outcome which uh the polls managed to get wrong again uh interestingly so the, i mean nobody I ever we, asked me no <laughs> no wait, wait who are these people i mean <laughs> I really i mean um, did, did they ask you for an opinion <laughs> they didn't ask me. No, they didn't ask my wife either or anyone they sort of no i don't i didn't ask anyone i know um <laughs> Maybe I don't know enough people or the right people. I don't know. But <laughs> the, the polls are amazingly consistent at getting it wrong, in, in my view. And I was reading an article over the weekend where the polls were actually congratulating themselves for getting it so right, which was sort of sort of rather yeah. contrary to what I was thinking. And uh, they, they justified it by their margin of error being, you know, 3% or whatever it is. Um, uh, but you know what? You, you can't argue it away with statistics. <laughs> they, you know, they they just constantly don't get it right. I mean, all the swing states went to to President Elect Trump. Um, you know, you look in the UK as well. You know, we had a, a, a Labour, a new government, a Labour government, um, who swept in, and the polls actually got that a little bit more right, but they got it wrong by the scale of the of, of the swing. And, you know, I think polls are all about margin, really. Um, they're all about what is the trend, what is the scale going to be? 
And I think, you know, uh, in, in, in the States, they certainly, uh, they got it wrong or they miscommunicated it uh, pretty badly. And there tends to be a left-leaning bias to polls, actually. And I, I'm not being political here, not left or right, and sort of somewhere in the middle, I guess. Um, but there's this sort of natural leaning. And one sort of wonders why that is. I mean, maybe it's because pollsters, maybe they're more East and West Coast based. I, I don't actually know. Um, but it's, so it's... you know what else? It's just that the media got behind it, you know, particularly the uh, cable channels. Uh, everybody in media said the poll said this, the poll said that day in and day out for weeks. And it just turned out to be bullshit. <laughs> Part yeah, of it. Well, but, yeah. but that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, so that's what caused so many people now in the aftermath, in the immediate aftermath, to be uneasy and worried and even afraid, um, uh, particularly with some of the recent extraordinary events. In well, I think Amsterdam, uh, other places is crazy. I, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, it is it's the the fear of the, the you know the unknowns. Um, I think a lot of the rhetoric has been quite alarmist, um, and maybe that has been used to emphasise direction. Um, will that what will that actually translate into um, once the new administration is in office? And I, I think the thing is, it, it, people just so uncertain. We don't actually know. Um, right. You know, it, it it seems that it's it's not so much more it's not so much rigid policy. I know there's immigration and there's you know thoughts on the economy and stuff like that, but it's not really defined policy. It's more sort of you know rah rah. This is what we want to do. We're going to be tough, or we can do this. We're going to do that. Um, and one wonders just how much thought has gone on behind it, uh, particularly when you look at the financials. You look at the economic impact, not just short term, but long term. Um, you look at the global ramifications, uh, which I think is really going to be fascinating um, to see how, you know, the global trade reacts. Um, you know, housing is quite an interesting one. Um, you know, in the UK, for example, so in London, um, Property is strongly influenced by central government policy. So planning, obviously interest rates, which, okay, is independent. But basically, that is sort of how you shift, right? Um, in the United States, it's done at state and local level. It's actually done at a different level. The thing that I'm sort of interested in, um, just wearing my my property hat for a moment, rather than and again, property rolls into relocation because it's where you get investment and landlords buying properties and all that stuff. Um, is the whole sort of thing, is state and local tax allowances, and what's quite interesting there, I think, is that under the previous uh, Trump administration, um, those were capped. Um, and it particularly hit the West Coast, California, and New York, and New York and the New York metro area, New Jersey, and so on. And one thing feels that that was maybe a bit politicized because you have a very high percentage of Democratic voters there. What's really interesting, I think, is, is, is that that, uh, that cap looks as though it may be removed. Um, and will it be replaced with another cap or will it just be taken off the table? Um, and this this is one of the things actually that can have a bit of a direct influence. So on, let me ask you on, for on definition: the uh, a cap would be on the putting a roof on how much tax there could be. Yeah. So the the cap at the moment, and I might might be slightly out on the figures. It's ten and a half thousand dollars a year. So any property taxes, um, state taxes you pay up to ten thousand. Uh, you don't have to pay tax on. So anything over than that, uh, you, you do. Now, prior to that, there was no cap. So you could set off your entire state and property taxes uh, you know, on, your, on your IRS tax return. Um, and that was a you know, big hit uh, when that came in. And it's interesting uh, that the thinking may have changed. I say may have changed because we don't actually know yet. 
um, but it it is widely reported in the media and by uh, those close to to President Elect Trump uh, that that is going to be on the table. So, so, so therefore, you uh, you and me and other homeowners could um, used to be able to uh, deduct state and local taxes from the federal tax. Is that correct? Yeah. And then That's there was right. a so we'll, cap we'll, put on it or an elimination of that benefit. Yeah. And that, so that now the talk is, uh, just to sum up, is that there's talk about removing the cap, uh, which means the tax deduction feature can increase. Yeah, exactly. Or in other words, you could deduct possibly more yeah. against federal taxes yes that is that's the gist of it um, i'm not quite sure what columns they, they fall into on the tax form i'm not an expert at filling in uh, irs tax forms um, me, me too <laughs> yeah and a few of us are i think um but, but but the bottom line is is that you get the tax break and uh, interesting. That, wow. Yeah. You no, know, it's good. I mean, it's it, it's it's great news. Certainly, uh, in in the Northeast and out in California, you know, ba basically places where you have higher, you know, high higher property values, um, and therefore you have, you know, property taxes tend to follow those. Um, so it's it's interesting. Now, I was uh, uh, well, we were driving back yesterday from uh, the home in uh, Palm Desert. Palm Valley Country Club, and uh, we're back here in San Diego now, and we're listening on the radio, and there was um, somebody talking, I don't know what station it was, uh, but they were talking about, if I can get this right in my brain here today, still early in the morning here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, they were talking about the speculation in the stock market since the election, you know, it just exploded up. And uh, yeah. because that's, and it's a bet. That's what uh, investors, VCs, uh, bankers, uh, a lot of people, they were betting that it's going to be better for business, at least in the short run, at least between now and Inauguration Day, <laughs> that um, it looks like it's, it's going to be a great American economy unleashed. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. The the Trump trade, as it's referred to down on down down the road here on Wall Street, um, and it, and the markets had a phenomenal bounce. Um, uh, for, certainly, the day after, you know, the, the the morning after the night before, sort of thing, they were apoplectic uh, with desire. Uh, for a, a strong Trump economy. Um, I mean, um, you know, and, and certain things stand out. So Tesla, uh, dear old Elon Musk, I mean, his, his shares went up 15% the following day. I mean, okay, he's slightly, you know, he's so close to, 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 uh, to Trump. Um, but across the board, uh, deregulation, uh, is seriously on the cards with a, a new Trump presidency, um, and I, I think that the Federal Trade Commission will be certainly changed. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think the other thing that's going to be interesting is what happens with the Fed. Uh, Trump is enormously hostile to the Fed. Uh, he doesn't believe in an independent Fed, um, and I'm, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying this is what he's saying, and. Um, we know that Trump would love to take control of interest rates. Uh, you know, Trump is a, a business animal. He's, a, you know, he is a, a fairly hard nose uh, new property developer or uh, from that ilk. Um, and he was never very popular in New York, by the way, in the property world. Um, but you know, he's my my way of looking at it um, is basically. You've got to say, well, what is going to be good for Trump personally and his businesses? And if you can figure that out, then that's going to give you a very good clue as to how he's going to be looking to position the economy, uh, taxes and legislation and so on. 
Um, is 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 he is he free market, open market? I'm not sure he is. I, I think actually he's quite protectionist. I mean, clearly he's talking about tariffs and, and so on. Um, but internally within the US, uh, yes, I, I would say he is a, a, a free marketeer. But by you know, but part of his strategy, and this is where it really starts getting tricky, uh, is going to be putting uh, tariffs on um, uh, people importing goods or exporting goods to the United States. And, you know, one size doesn't fit all. The, the problem with that is further down the line. The problem with that is that it's going to make U.S. products a lot more expensive internally to Americans because of the way the supply chains work, the global supply chains. So work. basically that is going to land squarely on top of the heads of the working class that he promised this and promised that to, but he's never explained in simple language that it's that population group yeah, that it, it's... believed in him enough to vote for him. That's who's going to get hurt much more than the current recent, recent inflation post-COVID. Uh, exactly. And that's what's going to happen. Um, it will trigger inflationary pressures. Um, that will mean that either, you know, the Fed will have to respond in some way. Maybe it's slowing down, just not being, hopefully it's, it's just more of a slowdown on interest rates coming down. Uh, but you can't rule out the interest rates starting to head in the other direction. Um, you know, that's the more of the, I'd say the traditional way, I mean, over the last, uh, since the Second World War, really. Um, that that is the way one addresses inflation. I mean, it's all, all governments across the across the world do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it can have a very much a a a, a, a backhanded impact on those people who have uh, who voted for him. Yeah. So I, I am not a financial guy, although I look at the Wall Street Journal every day, you know. And, but the uh... The bond market is what we're talking about here. And the big traders of bonds, these people who somehow know what they're doing with bonds, you know, we all thought that with the interest rate cut last month or the month before, and then the current one, that mortgage rates will go down. But they did fall a little bit, but now they're bouncing up again. And yeah. this is because the bond market rates have, are impacted by some really heavy duty investors who buy bonds, right? And it, the interest rates have ticked up, not gone down. Yeah, you know, you, you get all these uh, sort of very sort of uh, contradictory events taking place in the market. The market is totally irrational, by the way. Uh, I mean, I followed them quite closely. I'm not an expert. I mean, I you know, have an economic, uh, economics degree, which is useful, but times change and things move on a bit. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the bond situation, I mean, reflects that the money's got to come somewhere from somewhere to pay for all this stuff that's been proposed. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, re repatriation of immigrants, deportation rather i think it's the, the blunt of work and it's going to cost a lot of money to to do that um build the wall lock in the borders uh the southern borders i mean to do that is is you know these are serious bits of expenditure bits is an understatement they're massive uh and the money's got to come from somewhere and that money is either uh, coming from the the taxpayer. Ultimately, it will come from the taxpayer. The government will go out and they will borrow it from the banks. Um, but ultimately, that is where the money is going to have to be found. Um, and you know, the taxpayer and the economy companies. Um, you know, again, the the British model is quite interesting. Where, where the the British model, the American model, are often quite similar, but where they tend to really change, and this is particularly, uh, uh, this is actually with income tax and capital gains tax, uh, is on the thresholds. So the, the 
the the levels at which the tax kicks in. And in the United States, the tax levels where the tax kicks in tend to be much higher. Okay, which sort of means that there's more money will flow into the economy. The economy should should benefit from that. In places like the UK and the other countries as well, uh, because the tax thresholds are so much lower, there's less feeding through to the system. Um, the the bond market. I'm not an expert on bonds, um, and they 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 you know they they they're priced inversely to their returns, just to make it a bit more interesting. Um, but they're 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 you know they're 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 very sensitive, and you think they're going to move one way, and then actually they start to move in another. And of course, you've got you know a variety. You've got your ten-year bonds, your thirty-year bonds. You've got your two-year short-term. I mean, you know, and these are all indicators of you know how economists um, and 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 you know markets see see where the economy is going to go and where inflation is going to go. But at the end of the day, it is a gamble. You know, it, it, I love the American expression "prap shoot" because often. <laughs> You know, you have all these, these incredibly intelligent, well-versed, experienced traders and bond dealers and so on. And you think these guys know something we don't know. And at the end of the day, you can put, you know, a five-year-old kid in there with a dartboard and put something in there and he'll probably outperform the pros. So the what we're talking about here is how the government, U.S. government pays for things. And it's it's the treasuries. And the dollar standard, the gold standard uh, worldwide, is what juices all that. Now, I, that's where my knowledge ends. But uh, so the price of that loan, uh, okay, I need a, a crazy number, $100 billion or trillion dollars, okay? And the interest rate's going to be, okay, how much? Is the government going to have to pay the bondholders? And who are the bondholders? Well, it's really it's other banks, all right, and foundations and really super rich people. Nobody yeah. else. The yeah, pension bonds, funds. Right? Um, you know, those, those those sorts of types. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything is so so interconnected, and uh, it's really it's really complicated. I mean, it's really complicated. You throw swaps in there as well, and then they, you know, the micro movements that take place there. I mean, you know, you have to. You, my favorite joke. Can I tell you my favorite economist joke? Yes, please. My favorite economist <laughs> joke was told by a guy called Eddie George, uh, who was the governor of the Bank of England, who was the forerunner to Mark Kearney, who did, who did such a, a great job. And Eddie George's uh, favorite joke. Was and he used to say this at mansion house dinners in front of the great and the famous. He'd say, he said, in my experience, there are three types of economists: those who can count, and those who can't. <laughs> three. <laughs> Not bad from the governor of the Bank of England. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about real estate property. So. What kind of people uh, are buying? Now, I know you alluded to this earlier, uh, about ten minutes ago, um, and that is just a great customer story. <laughs> and so, thanks for sharing that. Uh, but who is buying into the U.S.? And it's mainly Manhattan, I guess. Uh, all the, you know, what percentage of all these super califragilistic buildings that, <laughs> that have been built recently, uh, basically since COVID, uh, in Manhattan, these very tall, skinny high rises, you yeah. know, aren't they yeah. afraid it's going to fall over or, or yeah. the, wind, the wind's yeah. going to pick it up and take it to China or something? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. But, but they build it right, whoever they are. And uh, these cost a fortune to buy. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there are amazing buildings here. Um, the Steinway uh, runs just, just down the road from me. I, I sort of go by, I look at these every day because one's here and wandering around and driving into Manhattan, um, coming across the bridges. You know, the, the, the view is just stunning. I mean, it takes my, every time, it takes my breath away. It really does. I mean, that's not a cliche. 
It really, really does. I go, wow, look at it. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, to answer your question, it's pretty well, most of them, most of the, uh, over the last, certainly since the pandemic, uh, has been domestic American bars, have been most of the big hitters here. Um, uh, the usual suspects, as you would say, so the hedge fund guys, uh, the big bankers, people like Ken Griffith, for example. Um, these are the guys uh, who have been doing the buying. Um, you, some of the tech guys have been here, and uh, they've, you know, Bezos uh, and various others. But mostly it's been, um, from, from what I've been seeing, I'm very close to it, uh, it tends so far to have been uh, more Americans uh, doing here. I'm not saying there hasn't been uh, any international, but it's tricky for international buyers. You know, they're, they're, um, they're a little reluctant um, to to buy here unless they can actually uh, make it, you know, very clear that they can get into the the, the sort of U.S. finance system and so on. Part part of the problem, I'm not saying that you know that people are crooked or they're doing anything wrong, but part of the problem here is is that there is this, um, I would call it a great misunderstanding or paranoia um, about international money coming into. Uh, the the New York property market, not just the New York market, but we're talking about New York, we're talking about Manhattan predominantly here. Um, because the professionals here, so the lawyers and the accountants and so on, there's a relatively small um, alcove with these people who are actually good and comfortable with dealing with international funds. If you go to... Um, uh, it's all to do with money laundering protection and the the federal government um, and the uh, the IRS are particularly um, diligent uh, and I would say aggressive in 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 sort of looking out for policing anything that uh, they're not comfortable with. And, and what that has done, it, what that I think has done, is that I think it's created quite a lot of paranoia uh, within the real estate and, uh, and related professionals here. Um, so, you know, I've often dealt with accountants, uh, lawyers, obviously, uh, and you can sort of, you know, you can hear the deep intake of breath if you're uh, talking about a, a client who may be coming through a, a tax neutral jurisdiction. So say the uh, US Virgin Islands or the Cayman Islands, uh, Switzerland. I mean, these are all out, you know, outside of America, um, all absolutely standard in, in my experience in, in London, in, in, in the Middle East, in Dubai. Uh, in Europe, it's it's quite common. They're vehicles that people use not to hide money, but really just to, you know, internationally organise themselves. Um, and it's tricky here. So what we do, we we do quite a bit of this actually. Um, we work with international clients on the real estate front end, okay, uh, to to steer them through the processes to ensure that they can get through and get their properties. Um, we do it uh, as, as a buyer's agent, okay, which we've done in London for, for 25 years, but we're now doing that here uh, in, in New York in the States. But we do it almost every day with international relocation assignees uh, coming in uh, to, to, to New York and to the metro area. And the, the classic, so I'll give you a couple of examples on, on this. So um, one of the, the, the things that is absolutely standard with New York landlords, American landlords, is getting a credit rating, okay, for the tenant. You need to know the credit rating. But of course, if you're international and coming to work in the States for the first time, and you're working with a bank or, you know, a pension fund or whatever, I mean, really, you know, big companies, terribly well funded and big salaries, you can't get a credit rating because you haven't got a credit history. So what we do is we help them, for example, get social security numbers. 
Because that's the other thing you have to have. You can't get a credit rating unless you've got a social security number. Um, but you can get a visa to come into the States or work visa without a social security number. So you've sort of got this sort of swirl going on, if you like. And what we do is we put those stocks in a row and we, we guide our clients to enable them to, to get these things to tick these boxes. And then we go to the landlords or the landlord's agents and we steer the agents and the landlords through and we present a profile. And that profile um, is often a combination of American documentation with their own domestic background. So to give you an example of that, we've recently acted for um, a couple of Australians, I'm delighted to say, even though they beat us at the rugby on Saturday, and that was not so <laughs> hard. But you've got to love them, though. They're a great, great, great team. Um, so the Wallabies. So we love acting for, for, for sort of Antipodeans. They're great. Um, <laughs> but what we did is we said, OK, you don't have an American credit rating, and we can explain that away, but you've probably got a good domestic credit rating. They go, yeah, we've got a great credit rating in Australia um, or London, wherever it's going to be. So we're right. Get that screenshot. Get that credit rating, okay? And we're going to present that to the American landlords and the American agents so they can see you're not some bod who's you know just got off the boat type of thing, that you actually are a professional person with a history, with assets, with uh, with a net worth and we put the package together and these are just examples there are other things we do as well and guess what we have a hundred percent success rate we haven't had any rejections at all um but we know what we're doing we know how to present it we know how we we, we understand people's concerns we know where people are going to say no and we say okay we understand that but here is this additional information um, and, you know, and the same is true when you're acting for clients who are buying uh, because they have to bring funds into the United States. Um, sometimes they borrow in the United States. I mean, we work with a, a bank who you know very well, um, who are excellent in that space. And uh, we've actually been able to pre-fund clients before they, before they come over. Fascinating talking with you, James Moss. And I'm just can't wait to circulate this program across uh, the global business news network because that's all business people and many international and according to linkedin this is as we come to a close here according to linkedin approximately 70 percent of our viewing audience this past year has been a boom year expansion of everything um, so approximately 70% of our viewers of programs like this, because of the distribution network that I've set up, very fortunately to be able to do that, and I'm grateful, is the number one market is Metro New York, as you've described it, but the number two market is UK. And, and, uh, the London business community uh, and, you know, all the communities around London where businesses are situated, big business, uh, more than a thousand employees. In fact, more than 40% of the audience are uh, managers or executives within companies having more than 1,000 employees. That's our uh, a, seg a large segment of our audience. And 70% are located in Metro New York region, which is a huge megalopolis, of course. Yeah. And I will say that will include from Boston area, south into Virginia, along the coast. Pardon me, itchy nose. Uh, so the New York market, meaning the East Coast, Northeast, is number one in the world of audience. And number two is London Metro. And number three is, well, I'll call it California, because in the north is San Francisco and Silicon Valley, which is vast. And in the south is LA, and the LA region, Southern California, goes to the Mexican border, uh, where I am, uh, 
uh, in San Diego. So it is, I mean, that's it. Now we have readers and audience <laughs> in Paris and Geneva and even in Moscow and Saudi Arabia and Cape Town and down under as well and in Tokyo and here and there. But that's the majority and the energy as I'm sure you would agree, Metro New York, Metro London and California. That's it. That's more than 70% of the people who will watch the show. Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, they're, they're, they're great markets. Um, you know, the the old sort of uh, across the pond thing, which works both ways, it's always a cliche. But you know what? Um, it's real. It's true. It's, it's safe. All, what's interesting is how much business, not necessarily UK or American business, goes through those channels. A lot of international goes through New York. Um, a lot of international obviously goes goes through London. I mean, London is a great hub for Europe and for the Middle East. So, you know, the time difference between London and, and Dubai is only three hours. I mean, the flight's eight hours, but the time difference is only three. The West Coast here is phenomenal. I mean, I you know, you, you look at, a, a, you know, just you know, go back to the election for a second. But, I mean, you look at the, the, the final map, the election map of... Of the United States, and yeah, you 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 sort of got you know New York and you've got California, and um, you know the the mindsets are, are very similar, and I also think particularly tech and entertainment, um, being out on the West Coast is phenomenal, um, and you know the 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 tech and entertainment industry for a long time has been really uh, you know, converging together. Um, and it's, you know, it's a powerhouse out there. Absolute powerhouse. It, it absolutely is. Uh, so back in 1984, 85, <laughs> uh, when I was publishing a print magazine called California Bound, which was an area economic development PR tool and also used as a recruitment tool and also used as a relocation information guide. The LA Chamber of Commerce and the LA Economic Development Corporation, those two organizations are like that, they became a partner with me in the early days and because they saw the convergence back then, this is a long time ago, this being 2024, and that was 1984, 85, okay? And California Bound became used by practically every uh, relocation company and real estate company uh, and uh, <coughs> major, major corporate employer. Uh, all of that coincided, just to give you some history and how it works together, and now coming up with... Uh, President Trump and the economic uh, impact of that. President Reagan was elected in 1980 mm. and mm. he vowed to control or uh, do something with the evil empire, i.e. Moscow, and yeah. mm. build up the defense department capabilities. And guess where that was circulated and based in California. Mm. And so the LA Chamber of Commerce and the LA Economic Development Corporation, of course, knew that board members are the, the top level, the C level of every major company and of course, smaller companies. And they said, Cohen, don't screw up. You're going to do really well, and we want this book to succeed. And it's a magazine, and they bought oh, fantastic thousands of copies. And then I took that letter and all that around to every possible advertiser, and that was the glue. And now at that time, interest rates, housing interest rates, we're like 15%, 18%. Yeah, and yeah, talk, no. I mean, that's like 
whoa. And yeah. the only people other than the mega, mega rich people, the only other people who could afford to possibly buy a home or a condo were people with a guaranteed income. And guess who has a guaranteed income? The companies that relocated certain people for a specific job and region. And that's what happened. Fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. You know, the, the interesting, there's lots of interesting things about that. But one of the things that, that strikes me is that the processes haven't changed that much, actually. It's going to happen again. Because yeah. the Defense Department, particularly the Navy, U.S. Navy, has... Uh, I mean, really strong. I'm here in San Diego, and sure. the headquarters of the Pacific Fleet is right across the street here. And um, and uh, so we see it. I mean, there's plenty of glitzy, gleaming uh, naval ships that go right down the harbor here, but there's a lot of older ships. And so there has to, the defense capability, particularly with the threat of North Korea, Iran, China, not to mention Moscow. But this is crazy stuff, but it's going to repeat. Reagan came in with the idea of doing this and doing that and cutting taxes. And guess what? Trump read his playbook. Yeah. Trump yeah. read Reagan's playbook and just that's what he's doing. I mean, th there's no mysteries. It's been done before. And Southern California, I did a little. Boom. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting on so many levels. I mean, we actually, I say we, my cousin and my guys here and my guys in London, uh, we actually help HR write the letters. We tell them what they need to put in the letters. I mean, that's we tell really them. smart. Yeah. I mean, we, we sort of prescribe really what's got to go in. And we like to vet the letters before they're issued to the landlords so we can edit them, fine tune them. Um, I mean, we're not micro, well, we are micromanaging a bit, but we're making sure that the right information is in there and it's saying the right thing in the right way. And it's really important. Um, and, you know, we again, we use foreign bank statements as well. I mean, there are all sorts of things that we do to make sure, and it's exactly what you're saying, exactly what you're saying. And the bottom line is landlords, um sellers okay want to know that the money's there and that it's going to be there and if you're if you're buying a, a property you're buying a, a home or an apartment or you're buying a commercial building um the first thing you do is you say proof of funds where are your proof of funds um relocation is exactly the same landlords are saying where's the guarantee that 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 salary is there and you know what we do? We we do the letter for them. I mean, it's a one company letter, headed paper and stuff like that. I mean, it looks absolutely fantastic. Um, but we also get copies of the pay slips, um, even though hard, even though maybe a few dollars have just gone through. But we want to join the dots, so the pay slips, the letters, the bank accounts. So the landlords it, go. Oh, da, you tell us. You da. tell a story. You, you tell, tell a story, story and there's no exactly. BS or any inkling exactly. of something weird. And no, you go the other way and you just display it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's true. Yeah. Yeah. And the so, point about interest rates, just to add on that, is a really great one. And I remember um, that, that very that period really, really well. And I remember um the the, the again, I'm going back to the UK because I was living in London at that time. And the British interest rates followed the American. Okay, so everyone was chatting. Here. And um, the chancellor was a guy called Norman Lamont. And in one day, Ed, the interest, I mean, in a few hours, one afternoon, the interest rates went from like 9% to 17%. Wow. And then back down to, you know, 15 or something. Now, this is the funny story. Funny, just to throw it in here, I actually met. Norman Lamont a couple of years ago at a social bash in London, someone's drinks party somewhere. And I sort of, I sort of, you know, sort of, went, sort of, I recognize you sort of thing, you know, typical, terrible thing. Anyway, we got chatting and I, and I, I said, I said, what, what, what actually happened that day? And I can't remember if it was Black Monday or whatever it was. It was, I think it was a terrible day. 
And he looked at me and he smiled. He said, well, the first thing to say is that I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> he, said, he said, I was actually out um, giving a presentation that morning uh, and lunchtime. And I didn't know uh, anything about it until about three o'clock in the afternoon when my, my staff briefed me. <laughs> wow. Isn't that interesting? That was the day that George Soros made his fortune. Mm. Gambling against the Bank of England. I mean, yeah. I mean, these little sort of anecdotal things under the carpet are... You, you know, one, you wonder how true. Well, you wonder, you know, maybe it's just a great story he likes to tell. I don't know. <laughs> Fascinating. So, Fascinating. okay, uh, how can people find you? What's the website? Curzon Central is the easiest one. So, curzoncentral.com. That's um, it. Okay. If, uh, we also have a, a, a separate one for the tech, which that's coming to have curzonreload.com. So, either yeah. of those uh, work, work perfectly okay. well. So why don't you swivel yourself uh, that way or this way so people can see that display behind you, okay? Yep, All right. there we go. Okay, a little bit more. And Slightly I'll get out of, of my way because you're on Global TV Talk Show. <laughs> as you can see this is a business unit of globalbusinessnews.net. And you should go and see what the U.S. Chips and Science Act was all about. That was the massive... Um, Biden investment program to near shore um, tech manufacturing, taking it out of dangerous places and bringing it into the U.S. and building up areas and building up the workforce and more on that later. And I will be republishing that exclusive interview that I had on Global TV with uh, uh, one of the chief architects, the writers <coughs> of the U.S. Science Chips Act. And this is a, a woman who's an attorney and she uh, works for Samsung Electronics USA and uh, fascinating interview. And the Republican leadership has already said they're not going to revoke it, but they may amend it somewhat well that's okay they'll put more money to work and so economic boom is happening right here in the u.s of a and james moss thank you for being uh, a customer uh, and a member of the global press club and together we learn how to use this medium a lot better and i invite you all to follow what james is doing tell us your story separate your personal brand from your professional brand. It's two pathways. Come learn from James and from me and others how to do it and how to apply it. Use Global TV for your vehicle and you'll be glad you did. Use my audience. It's sort of like rent the runway, you know, that clothing idea. Mm. You know, women can rent the clothing rather than buy it. Um, that they see on the fashion Milan or Paris or New York Fashion Week. They can rent those dresses, those outfits, rather than buy them. <laughs> so rent my audience. <laughs> Use it to build up your audience. And that's what James has been doing. Thank Excellent. you for playing Excellent. my game here. Okay, this is Ed signing off from the Mexican border. <laughs> and James is in Midtown Manhattan. I'll see you in a month. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers, Ed. Thank you much.